In this video, I want to talk about interactivity in terms of planning stories and in particular some of the genres that you might use that are available to you as a storyteller, including ergodic stories and what they mean and how you might plan those. And I'll briefly touch on some tools for interactive storytelling as well. Now, when we talk about genres of interactivity, there are actually lots and lots of types of interactivity that have become generic in the last couple of decades. Um, you might think of polls and quizzes, for example, as quite simple things that have been around for decades, but um, these have become generic in the sense that they're built into a lot of modern social media tools. Polls and quizzes have been added to, or polls in particular, have been added to Twitter and Facebook, for example. There are a lot of online tools for creating quizzes. Um, and these are quite a simple way to add interactivity to your story. An image map, on the other hand, is much more complex. This is where you might take an image such as a, a group of people or a picture of a particular situation and the user is able to roll over different parts of that image or click on different parts of that image to get different pieces of information. It might be, for example, an image of the characters from a story or a particular location in that story. Interactive video uh, often adds interactivity by also allowing people to click on hotspots on the video. For example, in um, YouTube for a while, you could create hotspots where they could click and it would play a different video based on clicking on a particular area of the screen at a particular time. And there are other tools that allow users to stop the video and branch off into other stories. Timelines are presentations of chronologies, obviously, where the user can move back and forth in, in the chronology of events. A slider is where you might have two images, quite often a before and after, and the user can move a slider to reveal and hide one of the two images. Uh, ergodic stories and games and bots will come on to in particular uh, in some of the subsequent slides in this presentation and I'm going to talk a little bit about clickable interactives as well which is um, now quite an old name for, for the general form of creating an interactive story online. Counters and countdowns are another simple way to add interactivity to a story. This is where say your story is about something that's going to happen then you might embed a real-time countdown to what's going to happen. Or a counter would be counting up uh, something that's taking place while the user is reading or playing. So for example a story about um, the stock market might count up um, the value of some sort of stock while the person is reading or it might be a counter of how many plastic bottles are being thrown away while the user has been reading the story about plastic waste. Personalization is obviously something we've talked about in the other video around interactivity um, and again this is a common format where the user provides some information and a different story is presented depending on the information that they provide. And it's worth pointing out that sometimes uh, we can make tools for our audience or apps that allow them to interact with the subject of the story in some way. For example, um, signing a petition related to the issue that our story is about or finding out more for themselves. I'm going to quickly look through a number of examples of these and it's worth spending some time on the slides associated with this video separately so that you can um, spend some more time exploring these stories and get some inspiration from them. This is an example of um, the ergodic story format that I mentioned earlier, um, but this is actually inviting the reader to contribute the steps in that story. Now, an ergodic story is a story that has branches and choices along the way. The best example of this is the Choose Your Own Adventure books, where the user or the reader um, is invited to make a choice on behalf of the protagonist of the story in terms of what they do next. And depending what choice you make, you would go to a certain page to find out what happened next. In this case, the audience has been invited to make the choices in terms of a story that's being told. And you can explore this Twitter thread in more detail at the link at the bottom of this slide. Some more ergodic stories uh, are here. Um, this one is um, a one that's by Ben Jackson, where he's used WordPress as the platform for his interactive game. 
In this case, like a choose your own adventure book, the reader is placed in the shoes of a protagonist who is living in London and a brawler is breaking out and they have to make choices about what to do, whether to go to the doctor, whether to leave London, things like that. Now, in this case, instead of having to turn a page, you simply have to click a link and Ben has created this story by creating a number of different pages on the website that can be linked to and clicked through. Another example is this one where you can change key world events and as you change them, an alternate timeline, which involves different things happening, um, is presented. So you can see here that if you um, changed Galileo being burned for heresy, so if you can um, change things so that he was burned for heresy, that kicks off a different series of events. For example, Isaac Newton becomes a preacher rather than a scientist and does different things. This again, these are all examples of ergodic storytelling. In this example, different Twitter accounts were created rather than links, and the story is uh, experienced by moving between those Twitter accounts, clicking on at links to move to the different parts of the story that are told through those different Twitter accounts. And here's another example of an ergodic story, uh, which is in this case about uh, music festivals. Now, Lev Manovich, um, who we've quoted in the other video about interactivity, talks about uh, database records and the idea of the difference between a database and a narrative. Now, you'll remember in the other video, Lev Manovich said that uh, what's happened with the age of a database is that the content and the interface have become separated, which makes interactivity much more possible and much easier and, as a result, more widespread. But simply having a database uh, separating content from interface doesn't necessarily mean you have a story, a narrative. A train timetable is a database and you can have an interface to that where you search for a train journey, but that doesn't create a story. What creates a story, Malevich points out, is that there needs to be some meaning, so some semantics and some logic of the connection. So, for example, in some of the ergodic games that we've looked at already, the logic of the connection between the different elements is that a protagonist is making a decision. So you click on a link based on the decision that the protagonist in the story is going to make, that, that you're going to choose for them. Now, you've only got a, normally a couple of choices, and these are meaningful choices as well. They're not going to be random choices in the story. In the example of um, Ebola in London, you might be choosing whether to go to the doctor or not. That's a meaningful choice that has semantics and there's a logic in the connection that if you make one choice, if they go to the GP, then the next thing that might happen is that they are test, tested positive or tested negative and so on. When we look at clickable interactives and other interactive formats, Sagal and here identified a number of different formats, a number of different ways of structuring those types of story. And these involve different levels and types of interactivity. In the martini glass structure, for example, um, the story often starts with an author-driven approach. In other words, the author is in control, the audience all get the same story. And then at some point later in the story, they have some choices in terms of where they might go, what information they get next. The interactive slideshow, in com contrast, is a much more linear structure and actually you just go through it step by step. What you can control is the pace at which you move, you can skip through quite quickly, you can spend more time on particular elements, but fundamentally it's a quite linear structure. In contrast, the drill down story starts with some sort of menu or series of options and you have total freedom essentially to choose where you go in that story. Here's one example of that structure. You can see in this the uh, reader can choose to find out about, uh, this is a story about women in politics, um, you can find out about whether voters ask gendered questions, you can listen to interviews where the interviewees have talked about the worst sexism they've experienced in politics. And they can choose to listen to all of these in any order they want, or just some of them. Now, there is some narrative structure here in terms of the introduction to 
the material, but fundamentally the structure here is very open and very interactive. In contrast, this is an example of the uh, slideshow approach where the user just clicks next through a series of steps in the story. And then we have um, this example. This is quite a good example of trying to give a couple of different interactive options to the reader. You'll notice that um, on the left uh, there's a part of the screen that says two of seven and there's a, a back arrow and a forward arrow here. This is obviously a story about basketball and one particular basketball player and um, and the kind of quality of the shots that they made and where they scored from. So presented in front of you is all the data about all the shots. This is very much a database uh, separate from an interface. But there is a narrative imposed on this that the, the uh, left and right arrows allow the reader to click through this story and click through a narration where different parts of this story are highlighted. So this is more of the interactive slideshow model. But you can also click explore on your own and just have total freedom to drill down into different parts of the marks, the different shots in the story. Now, interactive stories can take a number of different um, structures. They can uh, have branches, they can have different endings, um, they can have a lot of choices or they can have very few. And this introduces a number of different dynamics into the production process. One of these is simply cost and time. The more choices you introduce into a story, the more time and effort it's going to take to create the material to tell the story of those different branches of the story. This example in front of you is one structure presented in the interactive documentary guide, which is at the link in the bottom left. It's well worth exploring that to find out a bit more. And in fact, I'll click through now to show you what I mean. <coughs> so in this guide, um, the author talks about a number of different interactive narrative shapes. You can see some have multiple endings. This one, the fishbone narrative, all ends up at the same ending. And different types of shapes will have different effects, they will have different cost implications, um, and they involve different decisions as an author. So it's well worth exploring this and thinking about if you're going to create an interactive narrative, what sort of structure you might want and um, to what extent that gives control over to the audience and to what extent you retain control as the storyteller. To give you an example, a real life example of this in practice, the Netflix series or program Black Mirror Bandersnatch is one story which uses these ideas of ergodic storytelling. And uh, one person actually mapped out the paths that could be taken in the story and you can see the diagram on the right and also at the link in the bottom left. So you can get an idea of the complexity involved in that particular story when it comes to um, narrative structure. Quizzes I've mentioned uh, as another narrative structure um, or genre of interactivity. The, the tool PlayBuzz is a good place to um, try some of these techniques and play with tools to create quizzes, flip cards, swipers and other similar formats. And chatbots are also worth considering as a way of telling stories in an ergodic way. In a way chatbots are what you might call an ergodic narrator. They will ask you questions, uh, give you two or more options, and you will get a different path through the story based on those. And again, similar choices are there to be made about um, to what extent those paths diverge and you have many, many different options, and to what extent you might push the audience back into a central track. The drama series Humans has used bots on its um, Facebook page as part of their interactivity alongside the broadcast uh, story. And it's worth looking at some of their work and the link on this slide if you want to find out more about that approach in drama. And in this particular story, uh, a chatbot is used to create the effect of having a text exchange with um, someone selling a baby to illustrate a story about the underground baby trade in Malaysia. <laughs> 
Another dimension of interactivity that's going to become quite interesting in the next decade is the role of AI. Uh, one interactive documentary called Whispers of the Night had a character that responded to the audience in different ways, depending on the questions or, or things that they said. Um, but what was interesting about this is that the responses weren't scripted, as in the ergodic storytelling that we've looked at so far, but the responses were actually generated by an algorithm, by an artificial intelligence algorithm designed by the storyteller. So it may well be that we start to design those algorithms instead of scripts in future interactive storytelling. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about games as a particular genre of um, interactivity. Lev Manovich mentions that computer games don't follow the database logic that we've been focusing on so far, where we have content and an interface. In computer games, they follow the logic of an algorithm, a series of steps, um, and uh, uh, results that happen as a result of the actions of the uh, person playing. Jesper Yule is a particularly interesting person to read about um, computer games and narrative. One of the things that he talks about are the different distinctions between traditional narratives and computer games, which you can see here. Some of the uh, most interesting ones to point out are that uh, traditionally, computer games take place in real time. Uh, they take place in the present. You are playing now. What is happening in that story is happening right now in real time. Now, some computer games do introduce some temporality. So you might have cuts between time periods in the game and you're seeing more of those cinematic uh, techniques used in computer games. But the, the role of time in computer games is often quite different. They can also be much more abstract than traditional narratives and perhaps most fundamentally you can play them many times so you can you're trying to get different results based on your different actions. This is where the algorithm comes in. You're trying to see what um, impact your actions have on the end result based on the way that the algorithm interprets your actions and gives you different feedback as a result. Now you'll identify as three different types of games. Uh, games of progression, games of emergence, and abstract games. And again, if you are considering using a game in your storytelling, it's worth thinking about these different types and which one might be most appropriate. The abstract game is a game that doesn't have a world. It's uh, Tetris is probably uh, the best known example of a completely abstract game. A game of progression would be one where you're moving up through different levels, for example, um, fighting a different boss at the end of each level. The, um, the game Donkey Kong would be an example of this, where the game gets steadily harder as you move through. A game of emergence, in contrast, often involves being in some sort of game world that you're trying to change through different variables. The Sims is a very good example of a game of emergence. Um, and to some extent, you might argue that a game like FIFA is a game of emergence because you're changing your players, you're changing your tactics and trying to see what happens as a result. And uh, again, there are lots of examples to look at in the slides. Um, these are some examples of games of progression where you, you're kind of um, almost simple quiz games, but you're, they're getting harder as you go through. Um, a game of emergence might be something like fixing a, a town or country's budget. There are some videos as well of the Orwell game and Emily is Away, which you can watch to look at other examples. Um, you might have a simple kind of buzzword bingo as well as an example of a game of emergence. Uh, these aren't um, necessarily complex, for example. These are quite simple ways to introduce game mechanics into your storytelling. One reason why you might use games is to explain how a system works. Um, games are a good way of helping the audience see themselves inside a system to play with the different variables involved, the different levers, change things about that system and use that as a way of understanding how it works. For example, the game Cutthroat Capitalism puts you in the shoes of a pirate commander off the coast of Somalia and as a way of exploring piracy and the different dynamics involved in that. 
In the bottom right, you can see a game produced by Channel 4 about child labour, where you play the boss of a factory that employs children. And uh, again, you've got objectives to reach, and it's a good way of exploring why child labour exists. Uh, there's a video here as well that you may want to watch, which is about... Um, uh, war and, um, a, and a way of exploring that issue through games as well. Now when it comes to narrative concepts like suspense, um, Plue and Fursich have looked at the role of ludic suspense in games, in other words how games create suspense, and, and to, in particular two types of empathy. The first type, parallel empathy, is where the use of a player is in the shoes of the person in the game and they feel what they feel so they feel the pressure the tension the confusion because essentially they are playing that person with reactive empathy however um, the suspense is created because you have some sort of sympathy or pity for a character so you're not necessarily in their shoes but you still care what happens and again these are useful techniques concepts to use in your own work Another useful resource to look at in this regard is the background to the game Her, Her <coughs> Story, which is about um, where you watch videos of a suspect answering questions and have to decide on her guilt. Um, the link at the bottom there, how the architecture of Pan laid the foundations for her story, is uh, well worth reading as an explanation of how the game maker learned from a previous game that they had worked on. So let's finally move on to some of the tools involved in planning an interactive story. There's a whole list here of different tools that will allow you to create different types of interactivity in your stories, whether that's simple polls and quizzes, we've mentioned Playbuzz. Um, if you want to create image maps, ThingLink can do that. There are tools for interactive video and interactive maps, timelines, sliders, and so on. So again, in the slides you'll find lots of examples, uh, lots of tools that you can have a play with to try to introduce interactivity into your stories. Uh, Twine, for example, is a widely used tool for creating ergodic stories, choose your own adventure type stories, uh, where you essentially plan out the different elements, you plan out the structure, and then you can build a HTML website on top of that. Fold is a tool for creating uh, stories which run down the page in a traditional sense but also from left to right as well so the user can branch off to find out more about different dimensions of the story at different points. And Touchcast is a tool for creating interactive video used by a number of broadcasters um, including the BBC. Now one key problem to remember about interactivity is how the content is archived. Once you get into interactivity, you often, uh, this idea of separating the content and the interface, um, quite often one of those two gets lost, gets broken. The link between the two gets broken. So the database disappears or the interface is taken offline because the, the domain expires, something like that. So there is a big problem uh, in the industry, in culture, um, around how we archive some of this great interactive storytelling. And now there is a lot of work being done to try to find a way to make sure that interactive stories are not lost when the URL expires, for example. So just to sum up some of the key points from that video, we've looked through lots and lots of different examples and lots of different concepts and um, theorists. And Again, I'll emphasize that it's really worth going through those slides and clicking through to some of those examples, pausing this video um, and spending some time looking at both the examples of interactivity and the literature around it. The key point with interactivity is that it really challenges some of our ideas of narrative as storytellers. Um, and this can happen in a couple of ways. First of all, we can think interactivity is brilliant and want to give all the control over to the user. But ultimately, the user is still expecting us to tell them a story. So we do need to take on some of that responsibility. The other way is that we might resist interactivity and feel that we want all the control. And the question might be, well, how much do we need to assert control? What is going to be most effective 
in the story that we want to tell and how much we want to engage our audience. Secondly, it's worth recognising just how generic interactivity has become and this generic quality means that we can try to identify genres and consider which ones might be useful in our storytelling. Some of them, like quizzes and polls, are very very simple, some are more complex. Games then finally are probably one of the most complex genres and have to some extent evolved separately from a lot of the other interactivity that we've touched on. And games have their own logic, they can do different things, particularly around explaining systems involved in, their, in the stories that we're trying to tell. Now there's, as I said, lots you can read about this, particularly in the slides that we've uh, gone through, and uh, I'll repeat as well a couple of the links from the last uh, video in terms of further reading and listening. Interactivity and Code, for example, talks about some of the genres that we've covered in this video. And also at the bottom there, you'll find a couple of links if you want to see things that I've bookmarked either about games or bookmarks of actual games to give you more examples to play with.